Welcome, Project Zion podcast listeners. In honor of the 40th anniversary of the ordination of women in Community of Christ, we're reaching back into the archives and revisiting some great episodes on the topic. This is part two of a two-part series featuring host Brittany Mangelson and former President Becky Savage. It started as a single conversation, but there was so much material to cover that it spans two episodes. Brittany Mangelson here. This is going to be part two in my conversation with Becky Savage, who is a former member of Community of Christ First Presidency. And we are talking all about the ordination of women in Community of Christ. So our first episode that we did together goes over the history from the beginning of the church through 1984, which is when Doctrine and Covenants 156 was presented to the church. And that section of scripture provided for the ordination of women. And so part two just picks up exactly right where we left off. Enjoy the continued conversation. Thanks. All right. So, Becky, let's just get into Section 156. If I recall correctly, you were at that conference. So I'm just wondering what your experience was like being in the chamber when those words were read and in the aftermath. And uh, I don't really want to direct your comments too much. I just want you to share whatever you want about this moment in history and just continue the conversation. So I was one of the unordained uh, delegates to the 1984 World Conference, and uh, we were gathered in the auditorium chamber when President Sheehy came to read the words of counsel. And um, it's always a great expectation when words of counsel are brought before a World conference. You don't know what they're going to be, and it's all kind of this very special time. Prayers brought, special prayers are offered in, in anticipation or preparation for the words of counsel to be read. Um, it has preference of calls of leaders to the new offices in the church and all of that you know, you, that's done. And then it opened with um, paragraph three, and talks about servants have been diligently working and planning the building of the temple. Now, for generations, people have been anticipating the building of the temple as if the center place. And so when it, it was read that planning the building of the temple in the center place, and it says, let this work continue at an accelerated rate, there was this, oh, it was kind of this, I didn't think about it that much. It wasn't that big a deal on my radar. Um, but the people around me were ecstatic about this. They can now go ahead and build the temple. What a great thing this was. And that they could move forward with the building of the temple was such a wonderful blessing for so many in the chamber. So this um, instructions were already given for this great need for a spiritual awakening that's going to engender uh, will be engendered by the ministries experienced within the walls. So people tend to forget that Section 156 starts with this wonderful blessing of building of the temple and the purposes for the temple. It then follows with um, a section about what the ministries of the temple are to be and an, um, an admonition to say that great blessings are are pending from this building of the temple. And paragraph 4B talks about priesthood. And it says, priesthood offices already provided for in my church have always had the potential for su supplying blessings. So it, here it's talking about some of the functions, however, will be expanded and given additional meaning as the purposes of temple ministries are revealed more fully. And these are just coming to more fruition now. So this is 1984, and we just received at our last world conference talk, last couple of world conferences, expanded uh, expectations for the evangel ministry of evangelists um, and with additional blessings that can be performed by evangelists. I think there's additional ministries that have also come as a part of the understandings of temple and temple ministries. And then it talks about the purposes of the temple. 
dedicated to the pursuit of peace, reconciliation, healing of the spirit, strengthening of faith, preparation for witness, um, the wholeness of body, mind, and spirit, providing for leadership education for priesthood and, and member. So priesthood and member, member meaning disciples, um, place for meaning of the restoration, this healing and redeeming agent, given new life and understanding. Um, and then it talks about the planning should go forward. And then there's this additional following is also presented as the voice of the spirit. And hearing, hear, hear oh, oh, my people regarding my holy priesthood. So then there's this whole paragraph seven about the holy priesthood and talking about how the power of the priesthood has been in place for the, from the earliest years as a blessing and salvation of humanity. And then talking about how priesthood has been misunderstood for its purposes of calling and how some have taken pride, et cetera, and, it, and have not lived up to their calling to magnify their calling or to become, have become inactive. So even before we get to this issue of women and priesthood, there's this admonition to the men of priesthood to step up to their commitment to their calling in priesthood and what they are expected to do in their priesthood, to have an abiding faith and a desire to serve in humility and to function more fully and that the administrator officers should be following the provisions of the law and, and making sure people at all to it. And then the prophet says, I've heard the prayers of many about who should be called. And there was this hush. Now, it's who should be called to share burdens and responsibilities. Now, if we go back to an early principle in community of Christ of all are called. And I say to you now, as I've said in the past, that all are called according to gifts which have been given them. And this applies to priesthood as well as all other aspects of the work. So this is not, this is not a calling. Yes, it's a calling to priesthood, but we're also calling all members and disciples to other to all other aspects of the work. This is a call to mission for all people, all who are engaged in the work of the church. And then you could drop a pen and it would have been heard in the chamber for sure. Therefore, do not wonder that some women of the church are being called to priesthood responsibilities. And this is in harmony with my will. And where these calls have been known to my servants, they would, they may be processed according to provisions. Now, in my research um, in the archives, there were letters in the early 70s of administrators who were pro sent calls for women to the priesthood, which we know because of the general conference resolution had not been processed. But those had been coming since the early 70s of official calls of women to priesthood office, which had been denied because of the general conference resolution. So here is the, therefore do not wonder that some women in the church are being called and it is in harmony with my will. So we have the provision in the whereases that it has to be a provision by revelation, directed ordination of women and divine recognition of women as pertaining to the priesthood of either order. Um, and then nevertheless, now there's a prerequisite that's being added for the first time um, in terms of what happens before one who is called to priesthood can actually be ordained. Um, ordaining of women to priesthood, let this be done with deliberateness, but before they're laying on hands, there have to be specific guidelines and instructions and that includes um, what it put, is put in place that there have to be prerequisite courses taken before an ordination can be done. Now, the School of the Restoration had been offering priesthood courses for men for years. And this had been 
uh, a place for study for many, many years, but there had never been a prerequisite requirement of uh, courses before one was ordained. So it's not until women are called to priesthood that there is a requirement put in place that you have to take coursework before one is ordained. Uh, I say <laughs> that women knew all along that education is necessary, education and training is necessary to be prepared to bring the most, um, the most of one's already divinely given giftedness to its greatest fruition. So women were the ones who were fully aware that the training prepared one to be the best one could be at the beginning of one's ministry. So, <laughs> yes, it took the women <laughs> coming to ordination time of ordination to actually put in place temple school courses that helped to prepare more fully people being ordained into their priesthood offices. But then it talks about, remember, in many places, there's still uncertainty and misunderstanding about the principles of calling and giftedness. So this idea of who is called and how do you understand, how do those who have the responsibility of calling understand giftedness and its purpose? And is calling, um, obviously calling has a divine component. It also has an administrative responsibility and is calling uh, for a lifetime or is calling for a period of time um, is the calling and is for uh, serving, calling to priesthood is for serving the needs of the people. And if one's calling does not serve the needs of the people, is that calling then not needed at a particular for you know, it's only for that period of time in which the needs of the people are being met. So calling has this whole sphere, multiple spheres and layers of meaning to it that is also impacted by an individual's giftedness that has purpose and it in richness that develops over time as well. So then the admonition for the saints to have courage for the task um, of theirs to bring to pass the cause of Zion and prepare themselves with much study and earnest prayer. Now, this was read um, and then reread because <laughs> one reading was insufficient <laughs> to grasp the complexity of the multiple layers of, of counsel that were given uh, with this particular council, words of counsel. It, it, was, um, it was monumental. I looked down the row of uh, seats that I was in, and there were people crying. There were people grasping each other's hands. Um, there were uh, people reaching to seats ahead of them and holding shoulders. Um, there were individuals who got up and left the, cha the chamber when it got to the section of, therefore, do not wonder that some women of the church are, have been called, are being called. Um, there were conversations out in the hallways um, of distress. And in, at the break, there were people who, who clustered together in prayer because there was there was rejoicing, but then there was also distress for those that they knew would not accept these words of counsel as coming from God because of the scriptural admonition that many adhered to that women would not serve in the church in priesthood callings. And so almost immediately um, there was a sense of there would be loss because of this bold new guidance for the church. And yet there was great joy. So it, it was just such an interesting place to be. And I'm, I'm a pretty extreme introvert. So for me, it was um, 
it was a time for reflection, not that I did uh, agree with it because I had already a, a very deep conviction that women were already bringing the ministry equivalent to priesthood without the without ordination. They were already giving everything that was equivalent to priesthood ministry other than what was sanctioned of needing ordination in order to give uh, and serve in, as sacraments, to serve the sacraments. But um, so I, I had no question that this was of God, that I was uh, needing to understand more fully what it meant for the church as a whole. My dad was in the Council of Twelve and served as the apostle for the local jurisdictions and local stakes of the church. And he and his colleagues had been obviously dealing with um, with this and its ramifications for the church and, and had to deal with the ramifications of this for the church for for many, many months in the years ahead. So um he was in the dealing with the distress of that. <laughs> he and his adult child that was in the local area, but far enough away from the central uh, church congregations. I didn't have to have quite as much uh, immediate contact as he did with those who were most distressed. But it, it was difficult times for the church leaders in the immediate uh, aftermath. The um, conference dealt. Uh, line by line, as they do with all uh, words of counsel that come before the conference um, in the various councils orders of the uh, conference. And as uh, a delegate, we had our delegate session. Um, the process is to allow discussion or debate about each of those areas. But in, we voted line by line. You set the document as a whole. So there was prolonged discussions, certainly about this particular document it was brought before the conference. It was ultimately accepted for inclusion in the Doctrine and Covenants. And then there's a, there's a procession that happens at conference once a document is accepted and the president of the church, <laughs> you saw this. It's brought down through the, the <laughs> uh, through the chamber to the front of the auditorium. <laughs> the, uh, phew. Oh, what is it we see? Sorry, what was that? <laughs> what is it we sing? <laughs> There's a song that we sing. We thank the O God for a prophet. Was that? Yeah, we thank the O God for a prophet. Yeah, um, that's what we sing for President Beasley. We thank the O God for a prophet. So I think is the old, the original. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, quite the pomp and circumstance was those celebratory experiences. And the boldness of President Smith, Wally B. Smith. To bring this, uh, to bring this revelation to the church is profound. He is such a meek and mild person, very humble. Even while I was in the first presidency, he still had an office in our suite and would come, you know, weekly. He was still serving as uh, chair of the hunger committee and several other committees and he would come and still work in his office. And he is just such a humble person, kind and respectful. I mean, he can make difficult decisions, obviously, but the angst that he had to have gone through to bring this to the church during the time um, the church was going through so much change and societal change and social change and theological change and knowing that there would be distress and discord and animosity from friends and 
colleagues that he had known for so many years had to have caused you know, many, many sleepless, sleepless nights. And yet, as a prophet, leader of the church, he could not deny this as prophetic words and boldly stood through all of the discussions and dialogue and distressful communications. Um, I read some of the, there's, there's a, the trans, they actually do a word for word transcript of what is said at conference. I mean, literally a word for word transcript. And some of the things that were said are just awful um, and disrespectful even in the midst of what we hope is a, um, well, you hope it's a respectful communication. It's not. And he respectfully stood before the conference through it all and still, yeah, even to this day, confirms the, the Holy Spirit's guidance in bringing these words. So, as a person, you know, as a woman who had a, a very gifted mother who brought ministry side by side with, with my father for multiple years, serving in, in the field as a minister and then as an apostle, there was no doubt in my mind that women would, would be, uh, were ministering, bringing ministry, whether they would ever be priesthood. <laughs> I, I didn't know growing up, but when the when the document came and it said they were called to be priesthood, I was yet, yes, they are. <laughs> of course they are. So I had the wonderful opportunity 20 years later, uh, doing my thesis to open letters uh, written by women and some men who gave their testimonies of their experience being in the chamber or first hearing the words of counsel. So, in the archives, the, the Women's Ministry Commission uh, did a three-part study. They did ask women to write their personal experience um, of hearing the words of counsel. They had the first women who were ordained write their testimonies um, as well. And then they did some studies. So in 2005, I'm opening those letters for the first time out of the archives. So I've got the letter opener and opening their letters for the very first time, the first reader of those experiences. And the experiences were some of what I said, you know, silence, joy, joy and grief for what was going to come, testimonies or affirmations of their own sense of call, um, the, the sense of finally, you know, this has come, etc. So uh, it was just all of these affirmations of of sense of call, et cetera, that was happening. Wonderful, wonderful experience of being able to open those letters. So anybody who ever gets a chance to open something new out of archives, <laughs> it's a pretty neat experience to be able to do that. It's like, you know, history, you know, opening those letters for the first time. I can only imagine. <laughs> oh, pretty, pretty neat. I also then opened some of the letters of the women who were first ordained. And that was an interesting process because I start in uh, reading their testimonies and they started falling out in these, uh, I started making, I ended up making three piles. <laughs> um, there would be a testimony of someone who, who said that she in her call knew ahead of time that her calling she knew in her own inner self that she was called to a particular office so there's this pile of affirmations internal sense of affirmation of her call and so there's this pile of those who had a self knowing of a personal call and then there's another pile of, of no affirmation of sense of call whatsoever this you know surprise of Someone coming, the pastor coming to them and indicating that they have a call to a particular office and this surprise and shock and 
disbelief about this sense of call. And then some who are kind of in this, a few that are kind of in this middle of, well, I knew there were women who were called and I understood and recognized others who have a sense of call. And I've been doing some ministry and I'm okay with that. And I could go either way, you know, so a few in the middle, but pretty much they fall one or the other, this very self-assurance of a sense of call and then this no sense of call whatsoever and needing the affirmation of others to confirm that sense of call. And they really kind of fall out in those two piles of letters. Um, So very poignant letters and testimonies of calling into of the first women and of their experiences in their ordination process or their confirmation process. And this is where some of the distress happened. So women who were in more of the outlying areas um, would have, uh, some had some very very positive experiences in terms of acceptance of their call in their local congregation without any kind of um, distress from other members. But there were women who were in congregations or districts or stakes where there was a lot of opposition to their calls as first women. And some of those testimonies were very distressing. Now, there's not large numbers of those, but certainly enough to raise concerns uh, with administrators, church leaders, uh, about processes that were necessary put in place to help protect the process for affirming. So this is how it goes. Um, a call is, um, comes to a local leader pastor in terms of recognizing the giftedness of someone in terms of a call to a priesthood office. Administratively, that is communicated to the next jurisdictional level. So there's administrative approvals that happen before that an individual is ever um, approached in terms of that call. And administratively, those things are approved before uh, the pastor or supervisor, whoever that person is, approaches the individual. So all of that approval is done first. Let's say the pastor then goes to the individual to present the call. And the individual then has up to a year to make a decision about accepting their call to their priesthood office or not. It is a confidential process of consideration, usually allowing one to share with their spouse if they're married or a significant other about their call. Um, And once the person accepts the call and makes the decision to to, um, accept the call, there's also a next step, a common consent process um, that involves the local congregation um, and or mission center um, also approving their call because we serve those in our, I mean, we accept our call to serve those in our local congregation or mission center or the world church, depending on the level in which the priesthood call is. So those that we serve also agree to accept that call for the individual. So it's at that jurisdictional level where there was people that were voting against the calls for women. And some of that happened pretty aggressively, particularly in some of the local areas around headquarters in in the independence area. Um, So, and it happened out in some of the outer jurisdictions as well, where individuals who were against the calls of some of the first women would get inactive members to come to that conference to vote down the woman's call to their priesthood office. And those, if you could imagine, you've made a commitment as a first woman to a call to priesthood. You've, you know, made that spiritual discernment process, been approved through all the jurisdictional levels, and now you're going before your local congregation, your local district, or your local stake, before those that you're going to serve, and people are standing for and against you, making testimonies or statements for or against you, and they make a vote in your presence. And there were those who were voted down. So anyway, 
and boldly, some, you know, didn't ever go back for a second, but boldly, many went back for a subsequent conference and were voted in mm. to their office. So, <laughs> oh, the early years. Oh, my goodness. So, ultimately, um, having taken the new courses, scripture study, intro to scripture, intro to care and ministries, and an intro to the particular office that one was called to for ordination. Um, and then the women were into new ministry. Now, if you think about this, uh, as first generation ordained women in community of Christ, we've watched the ministry of priesthood, but we've watched as non priesthood members. <laughs> and, um, it's different when you're a priesthood member. You you know the nuances of ministry. So I, for example, the first time I was to serve communion as an ordained elder, you gather in the back and organize for how the emblems are to be, the prayers to be said, and the emblems are to be set up and set up and the prayer to be said, and then how you're to serve. Well, it all kind of makes sense, but if you've never really served, you've received, but you've never served, there's still logistics that go with the serving that are different and you don't understand if you've not ever done it before. So there are just nuances to that, that as men or young young boys and or men, your father, who was a priesthood member, and it conveys those things to you in preparation for your coming priesthood ordination that a father would not ever convey to a, a child, young girl or young teenager, because there was no expectation that you would ever be ordained. So <laughs> I would say to my husband, okay, I'm doing communion now for the first time. So is there a particular way you hold the plate? Is there a way that you uh, present the plate and or the the uh, cups to people in a way that makes it easier for them to get the bread and the the wine? I mean, do you hold it in a certain way? Is that do they do you shift the the cup holder around in a way so that they can put their cups in a different position? I mean, it's just little tiny logistics that they seem little right now, but when you're doing it for the first time, they make a difference because my brain, which needs to have detailed process, wanted to know those logistics. So as a first time person doing the serving for communion, I wanted to know those specifics. Now, the first time I served communion, I happened to be on the inner side of the row where one of our most conservative male members of the congregation was sitting. And because I was happened to be on that row, he got up and left. He did not want to be served by a woman. We'd been thinking appropriately. All they had to do was move me to the other side and mm. he would have been served by a man. And we did that any time after that. But, you know, it's those little logistics that, we have to make accommodation for as newly ordained women serving and meeting the needs of a congregation that's adjusting to the first women ordained in our congregations. And as men and women serving together, we can do that. We absolutely can make those accommodations once we understand what the needs of the members are within the congregation. And some of those needs weren't evident immediately. And became evident very, very early on, but you know, we just didn't know immediately. And so this brings me to another question, and you've shared so much with us, Becky. I actually think we'll probably split this into two a two parter because the stories and the histories that you have shared have just been so good, and I think we have enough content. Uh, for two full episodes, which I'm deeply, deeply, deeply appreciative of. Um, and so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to know 
Um, and I'm going to get choked up now too. <laughs> Whew. As one of the pioneering women to serve the church in ordained ministry, and as the first woman who was uh, ordained into the presidency, who was invited to serve in the, uh, you know, one of the most governing bodies, authority, if you will, um, a counselor to the president of the church, I would love to uh, hear your testimony of the importance of women in the decision-making process and in ordained ministry in general. Call it a testimony, if you will, Um, but just your thoughts on the gravity and the importance of it. Uh, I feel like we have, like I shared in our introduction, we have a whole episode with you about your particular journey, and then now you've shared the history and the experiences of others in the church. Um, So I think ending with just some wrap up thoughts of of how important it has been in your life and how you have seen the church be blessed. If you could share some of your thoughts on that, um, I'll stop crying and <laughs> and let you speak. <laughs> I, I wish I had President Beasy's words before me the day after my ordination when um, he said to the conference, quite obvious, that we are now first presidency with a woman. And I want the conference to be aware that we serve as equals. That Becky, as a woman, serves equally as Dave and I do as a member of the first presidency. He made it clear at the very first of that day that there was to be no difference between male and female. As a statement to the church, he was saying, men and women are equal, and we serve together. We are richer as we serve together. The church, with women in ordained priesthood positions and roles, is richer because as men and women, we serve together. Women bring a ministry and a richness in their giftedness that men cannot bring. They bring it in their special way as individuals, in their own giftedness and blessings that have been given them as individuals. They bring giftedness as a group as well a richness, an insight, a special spirit that cannot be brought by men. Men bring giftedness and insights and spiritual insights that cannot be brought by women because of the giftedness brought by God to them. And together, men and women bless the church. And bring a wholeness that I think is part of God's plan for us as we journey toward Zion. If we can learn to work together in our giftedness, in our um, capacity to know what it's like to be the true children of God and the blessing that God gives us each in our own gender, in our own uniqueness, we can learn to enrich one another, we will be even more blessed in our mission. It's just the opportunity we have to learn to appreciate each one's giftedness. And that means woman to woman, man to man, man to woman. That's all of that uniqueness of being humans, learning to appreciate one another. Now, it's been interesting in the movement since 1985 and the first ordination of women to see how many women have taken on responsibilities of leadership in local congregations 
in our regional level um, mission centers and in leadership roles and um, the major leadership roles of the church. Um, It has not diminished the roles and leadership responsibilities for men. In some cases, there are places where some had said men have stepped back, but I think it's those individual men who've made that decision, not that women have diminished the men. Men have every uh, opportunity to continue to bring their rich ministry along with and beside, side by side with women. And women want to bring the same gifted ministry they have along with men who want to work with them. Are there places still where women are diminished in their ministry? Unfortunately, yes, there are places where that happens. Um, And there's still opportunities for uh, women to learn to be, um, learn what it is that they have to give. So, for example, a couple of years before I left the First Presidency, I was uh, bringing leadership retreat in Central America. And the women there were still introducing themselves as I am Mrs. whatever my husband's name is. I mean, it's still back decades from where we were, I would say probably 40s to 50s um, era of where we were in terms of women being recognized for where the status of their husbands were in the church. That's how women got their recognition. But that's just where they were. It, sociologically, that's, that's where they were. Uh, and yet they were open to learning and about scripture and the role of women in scripture and what they could be in terms of their own leadership. That's what they were there for, a women's leaders retreat um, to learn and grow. Um, so internationally, there's still opportunities. But overall, women have blessed the church and the priesthood ministries and are helping member disciples learn that each member and disciple is also a contributing minister to a mission of the church. So you don't have to be in priesthood to be a contributing member to the mission of the church. We all contribute. So if you look at a big priesthood chart that the, came out in 2013, I think it was, it starts with the member the disciple and then has priesthood offices that we all start first as member. And that's where we fundamentally are first, foundationally. And we're all mem- members and disciples first learning how to be the best responders to the mission of Jesus Christ. So. It's been an exciting journey. We've come a long way in a very short time. It's pretty, pretty amazing considering all that has happened in a denomination that started in 1830 and in 154 years moved to women's ordination in 1984. Pretty amazing. Whew, again, I'm a little emotional. <laughs> um. It is amazing. And I think that this identity that has sprung from our earliest days as a church uh, and to see that prophetic impulse and to see women and men uh, challenging and working with gender stereotypes and typical roles, if you will, of women and questioning and supporting and sustaining. I mean, all of these words are just flooding me right now of decades and decades and decades of listening to where God is calling us and opening the door to women in ministry has opened the door to other avenues of ministry for other other diversity of people. Um, you know, I think that, gosh, had we not ordained women, I don't think we could have come to a place where we ordained and were affirming of the LGBTQ population. And, and I just see, uh, the ripple effect of women's ordained ministry and how, from my perspective, it is the most natural reflection of who we are. And it just naturally flows through us. And for me personally, hearing the stories of the men and women who were part of this journey from the earliest days when women were ordained has really helped me heal 
with my community, with men in general, and with this perceived power and authority that is seen as very top heavy and just very aggressive and um, arrogant, if you will. (laughs) But uh, the priesthood and community of Christ is so much more than that. It is servant ministry and it is, it taps into the giftedness of the individuals and the needs of the congregation or the needs of your field or of your mission center. And uh, I'm just filled with a lot of gratitude right now that so many brave men and women were willing to have the conversation and were willing to go there, even if the price was high and the price was high. And I don't want to skirt around that. Uh, the, The reality is a lot of people were deeply, deeply wounded with this decision Uh, But I did, I was able to interview Wallace B. Smith before World Conference 2016, and I was just brand new to this, and sometimes I can't even stand to listen to that interview because you can tell how nervous I am, (laughs) but he did say uh, that he doesn't regret it, that it was the right decision, and that the church is on the correct path, and he uh, continue to, sh- to show his support of the direction the church is heading now and decisions that we've made in recent years. Uh, and it really just sings to me um, that the spirit of the re- restoration is alive and well and more pertinent today than ever before. So, whew, okay, I don't think I'm crying anymore, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, pretty, pretty darn amazing. Yeah. It really is. And do you have any final thoughts? I mean, I, I feel like I've taken up your whole day, but I, I am so grateful for this gift that you have, have given us in uh, your work and your research and your ability to tell story and your ability to just share your heart. I will say just another personal part of the journey. Um, as, as part of this research, I started with a book that was written by Sue Monk Kidd called The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. So my personal journey writing the thesis ended up being much more difficult than maybe it would have been if all I was doing was uh, doing, pulling research and reading articles and studying the Saints Herald, et cetera. Um, So as a woman growing up in Community of Christ, I was a part of the culture. Um, I had to... um, determine or to unravel what I had grown into as a socialized female um, in the culture of the time, with the culture of the church, what I had accepted as my prescribed role as a female. And writing the thesis, uh, understanding where women had journeyed, um, where women were prescribed in terms of their role in the church um, and where I had accepted my role in the church to be. Unraveling all of that um, became a significant part of my journey in seminary and in writing the thesis. What I came out of that understanding is I had a choice. I had a choice Um, of deciding where I wanted my place to be in the church as a woman, as a member, um, as a priesthood member, as an employee of the church, as a field minister in the church, um, as a future contributor with the church, as a wife, a mother. All of those um, opportunities were laid before me as I fully explored what God had given me as a gift as a female, one who's blessed with God's spirit, a body, mind, and spirit. All of this given fully as a gift um, by God. So what I'm going to do with this vessel that I've now kind of cleared out of all this stuff um, How am I going to replant it with this new knowledge, this new awakening of, um, well, certainly knowledge, but understanding and spiritual insights that I had not had before. And in all of that, it didn't come away with 
um, an anger of what writers have done with scripture or what writers have done with the role of women in society or how women have been pigeonholed into particular roles or all of those kinds of things. Anger wasn't my default. It was more, well, this is what has happened in terms of where women have been put. But I now have a choice of where I want to be. And I want to be in a place where I can be open to saying yes to Christ's call to mission. I want to be a part of a community that says we proclaim Jesus Christ and promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. I want to contribute to a mission of wholeness. I want to be in mission with others who walk this path with these amazing enduring principles and mission initiatives. I want to be an equal partner with those who walk side by side, men and women, who together will go over the bumps and the hurdles and meet the challenges ahead of us. And I want to do that as an equal partner. But that's what I came out of this awesome and difficult journey. And it was a difficult journey. It's not something that you do easily, giving up all of this previous programming <laughs> of what was right and or wrong. And it, it's, it was a, uh, a difficult multi, multi-year step-by-step process of making decisions step by step of what I chose to do, to give up or to take back based on the steps of that process. So out of all of this, this journey toward ordination uh, ended up being a self journey toward acceptance of a new mission. I was just going to say, as you were describing that, it sounds like the journey that the church took uh, is yep. also one that especially that first generation of women had to take themselves um, when you don't grow up with it, when it's not your norm, when your grandma wasn't ordained, uh, that you had to really accept that for yourself and to learn the history and uh, women's, you know, quote unquote place in the world. And you get to decide, does that make you anger, angry and entrenched? Uh, in in those bitter feelings, or do you heal and propel in ministry in a way that brings peace and reconciliation to the world? So I'm personally grateful for the path that you took. <laughs> um, it's it's been a, a joy to get to know you more and to have you on the podcast and um, just to hear your story. I think that this is one that is going to do a lot of good and bring a lot of hope to people. And uh, just deepen our appreciation of where we have been and where we are going. And it's, to me, really humbling and exciting. And again, all those words that I <laughs> said floating around are still, are still kind of floating around. So I just want to thank you, Becky. This has, been, this has been a real treat. You're welcome. It's always good to be with you. I'm Blake Smith, and you've been listening to Project Zion Podcast. For more episodes, you can find us at projectzionpodcast.org or on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.